Presented by Caltech. Jason received his PhD from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara in 2007. And he spent uh, three years at Caltech uh, as a prize fellow. Uh, then he became uh, an assistant professor at uh, UC Irvine, but uh, he remained a frequent and very welcome visitor at Caltech. And uh, now we're happy uh, to have him as a uh, Caltech faculty member. Actually, uh, we worry a little bit because Jason uh, lives in the same house as uh, Matthew Fisher used to live. And Matthew spent a year at Caltech and then left. But uh, so far, so good. Apparently, there is nothing wrong with that house. <laughs> um, Jason uh, has worked uh, on a variety of condensed matter topics, including uh, um, spin liquids, uh, quantum Hall effect, and exotic topological phases. And uh, he is uh, most known uh, for his work uh, on uh, uh, realizing, uh, explaining how to uh, realize and manipulate with Majorana fermions in a condensed matter system. I have a particular reason to like this work because uh, uh, several years ago I wrote a paper about Majorana qubits, uh, but in the end I had to say, uh, here is a toy model. It gives you a qubit that is protected uh, from decoherence, but uh, I don't know how to actually build it. Uh, the problem is that uh, electrons uh, come uh, with spin, and to make a Majorana qubit, uh, you need to get rid of one spin component to neutralize it somehow. Fortunately, uh, uh, there are uh, smart people who figured how to do that, and uh, Jason, in particular, figured how to do it uh, in two dimensions using uh, a certain uh, type of spin orbit interaction and uh, parallel magnetic field. And he also made a few proposals of how to uh, implement quantum gates with Majorana qubits. Today, he will speak about uh, designer non-abelian anions. Thank you, Alexei, for the kind introduction. Um, so I also wanted to thank uh, Patrick Hayden's brand new daughter for her impeccable timing. Um, because if it weren't for that uh, timing, uh, I wouldn't be here. So I was fortunate that there was an <laughs> opening in the Elite Eight of uh, former uh, prize postdocs, which I'm honored to, honored to fill in. Uh, so in my talk today, I'd like to uh, tell you about a problem that's been uh, very actively pursued by many students, uh, postdocs and faculty here at Caltech during the last five years or so. And I'll, I'll try to give you um, a sense for what order one things we've learned in this area uh, during the past few years and what the current state of the art is in this field. So let me first of all begin by uh, telling you what I mean by my title, so designer non-abelian anions. I'm going to do this in two stages. So first I'm going to tell you what uh, non-abelian anions are and then I'll tell you what this qualifier designer uh, means. So to introduce what a non-abelian anion is, I have to go actually all the way back to one of the very basic ingredients in many particle quantum mechanics, which is the idea of indistinguishable particles and how wave functions transform when you take pairs of them and exchange their positions. So broadly speaking, there's only a few different possibilities for what can happen here. If you were dealing with ordinary bosons and fermions, we know that the wave function would either remain invariant under that interchange or it would get a minus sign. In our three-dimensional world that we live in, uh, for topological reasons, it turns out that uh, all fundamental particles that exist in nature must be one or the other, either bosons or fermions, and, and there's uh, no room for anything else. But interestingly, this doesn't quite exhaust the full set of possibilities that we have at our disposal, uh, because if you take large collections of those bosons and fermions, put them together to make a material, that material can, in a very precise sense, uh, bear new emergent kinds of particles which have uh, more interesting exchange statistics than the elementary constituents. So those kind of emergent particles are generically known as anions. They come in two different flavors. Uh, one flavor are so-called abelian anions. Here already something quite interesting happens. If you exchange two of these uh, kind of particles, your wave function gets a complex phase factor e to the i theta, which is intermediate between plus or minus one. Uh, 
We call these abelian because if you were to perform multiple exchanges of these kinds of particles, the order doesn't matter. You just get a bunch of phase factors, and the order in which you multiply those is irrelevant. Now, as I'll say a little bit more later on, um, uh, we know nowadays of many experimental platforms that almost certainly give us abelian anions. In fact, right here at Caltech and Jim Eisenstein's lab, he's routinely making samples that almost certainly support these kinds of emergent particles. My talk today is all, all, all about the second flavor, uh, so-called non-abelian anions, which are much more exotic and elusive objects compared to their abelian cousins. Now, one of the hallmarks of non-abelian anions is that they give rise to a ground state degeneracy that scales exponentially in some way with the number of anions that are nucleated in your system. So, for example, as you start to introduce uh, anions into your material, you get increasingly large number of, of degenerate ground states that your system has uh, access to. So let's imagine that you initialize your system into one of those degenerate ground states, let's call it psi sub A, and then braid two of these non-abelian anions around each other, as shown here. So in this case, something rather extraordinary happens. So this wave function uh, isn't just going to, in general, acquire a phase factor, but instead, exchanging these non-abelian anions fundamentally transforms the quantum state of your system, despite the fact that these are indistinguishable particles. So uh, more formally, after the exchange, you're going to end up in a physically different ground state than the one you began in. And that, uh, that rotation in Hilbert space is described by a braid matrix U. Okay. So we know that matrix multiplication is generally non-commutative. That's why we call these non-abelian anions. If you perform subsequent exchanges of these particles, order now matters. Right? The final state that you end up in is sensitive to the sequence in which individual exchanges are carried out. Uh, so this is a phenomenon known as non-abelian statistics. I think it's wildly interesting just from a purely fundamental physics point of view. Right, this is the most exotic type of exchange statistics that nature, as a matter of principle, allows us to see. And to actually observe something like, th like this in the laboratory would be, I think, an uh, uh, amazing development. Uh, Alexei actually taught us that there's another reason to be interested in these kinds of particles, which is that if you had a system of non-abelian anions, you can, in principle, use that system to uh, perform so-called topological quantum computing, which is in intrinsically immune against decoherence at the level of your system's hardware. So the basic idea is, using non-abelian anions, we can non-locally en encode qubits in terms of the degenerate wave functions that they uh, give to us. Moreover, by uh, virtue of their exotic statistics, we can non-locally manipulate the state of those qubits by uh, performing braiding operations. And for this application, you can view these braid matrices U as representing quantum gates that are uh, imposed on your set of qubits. So the, uh, the key idea here is that since the information is both stored and processed non-locally, local perturbations from the environment are uh, suddenly benign. We no longer care about them. This is a, an extremely elegant and ingenious idea for how to beat the infamous decoherence problem, which to date has stymied all efforts at building uh, scalable uh, quantum computers. Um, I like to affectionately refer to this as Alexei Kataev's $3 million idea, for reasons that people uh, presumably know about. So the theme of my talk basically is going to be how do you bring this beautiful idea to life? Right? How do you build hardware that allows us to, s to glimpse this new kind of quantum mechanics, this new aspect of quantum mechanics that has never been before perceived in the lab, and how do you use that eventually to, uh, to build new kind of technology? So this naturally leads me into this uh, um, issue of what I mean by designer non-abelian anions. So I'm going to try to put this into context in a scientifically rigorous way using what I'm calling the Fisher plot. Okay. So when I was in, in graduate school, my advisor, Matthew Fisher, described problems in condensed matter theory to me in terms of points in a two-dimensional plane uh, with uh, experimental relevance on one axis and conceptual novelty on another. So roughly speaking, you know, where one prefers to work in this, in this space is largely a matter of taste. I'm just going to make one judgment call, which I doubt anybody would uh, disagree with, which is that the, the origin and points near the origin is probably not the best uh, place to be spending a lot of your time. These are kind of not even wrong uh, kind of problems. But outside of that, you know, there's, uh, there's value to, to um, all kinds of different problems. Uh, I think there's another uh, sort of special place in this, in this uh, plane, which is the upper right corner. So in that upper right corner, those are problems where you're combining a high degree of uh, conceptual novelty with a high degree of experimental relevance. If you're working out there, you have uh, the best chance of having a meaningful dialogue with experimentalists. And if you play your cards right, you might even get them to try some, to implement some of your ideas in the laboratory. And to many condensed matter theorists, that's the goal, right? We want to try to make something happen in, 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 uh, in labs. Now, the problem of non-abelian anions, um, it was invented uh, in the late 1980s by people like uh, Moore, Seiberg, Witten, and others. 
And uh, back then, this problem would most certainly have belonged far along this uh, conceptual novelty axis. But in those early years, it had no obvious experimental home. So that began to change uh, quite significantly in 1991. There was a major boost uh, towards experimental relevance, which has continued with a particularly rapid ascent during the last uh, five or six years. Okay. So this now finally leads me to uh, designer non-abelian enions. What's happened in the last five or six years is that we've begun to figure out how we can take materials which individually we understand perfectly well, you can find them in laboratories across the world, and then combine those materials in a very precise way to really force non-abelian enions into your system, even if you know, individually you would, you would have no chance of, of getting uh, something so exotic by just looking at the individual components. So there's a kind of engineering approach which has been brought to the table. Uh, that's what I mean by a designer non-abelian enion. It's a kind of non-abelian enion which is uh, generated in some kind of engineered uh, platform. Experimentalists have fortunately taken uh, notice of these ideas. And uh, nowadays, actually, the pursuit of non-abelian enions is very much a vibrant experimental field of research. I'd like to now say a little bit more about how this happened. How did this problem go from something that you would, uh, I think, reasonably call a mathematically abstract, but, but a certainly very elegant idea, into something that nowadays is, uh, is, again, an experimentally vibrant field of research? I want to go through a little bit of a primer here. Um, the quantum Hall effect uh, it tur turns out to play an essential role in this story. And I know there's a diverse crowd, so I just want to give a few, two or three slides, just a broad overview of what quantum, quantum Hall of physics is about to put uh, later things I say into proper perspective. So quantum Hall physics is seen in two-dimensional electron systems, which are subjected to strong perpendicular magnetic fields. If you were to think about what those electrons do from a classical point of view, it's not too interesting. They just undergo uh, circular orbits at the cyclotron frequency due to, due to the Lorentz force. If you treat the problem quantum mechanically, it becomes vastly richer. In a quantum mechanical description, the kinetic energy for the electrons inside of that uh, two-dimensional system gets quenched into a series of uh, what are known as lambda levels, each of which are highly degenerate. And they're separated by uh, an energy which is h bar times the cyclotron frequency. The physics of these systems depends very sensitively on how those lambda levels are filled. And as you change that filling, you will cycle your system through a variety of very interesting quantum Hall phases that uh, can be quite extraordinarily exotic and differ in, in terms of the kinds of excitations that they allow us to, to, to generate. Let me start with the, the simplest uh, possible case, which is this, uh, the situation where you have, let's say, one lambda level completely full and everything else is just empty. So this, in this case, you get what's known as the integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, that's a, a, a state where, uh, in the bulk of the system, you just have ordinary electronic excitations that carry the bare charge E of an electron. Now, what's much more interesting and non-trivial is what happens when you have only a fraction of a lambda level full. Okay, so imagine that it's a third, uh, exactly one third full. In this case, uh, interactions conspire to uh, generate a very interesting fractionalized phase of matter in which the elementary excitations no longer carry charge E, but instead they carry a fraction of the electron charge, right? despite the fact that electron is an individual, indivisible particle. So inside of this, uh, this one-third uh, one filled lambda level system, there will be excitations which carry charge E over 3. And remarkably, those E over 3 excitations are realizations of abelian enions. So far, what I'm describing is uh, it's certainly very beautiful and exotic physics, but this is really state-of-the-art uh, uh, around 1980s, right? So this has been well-established since the 1980s. And nowadays, you can see this kind of, uh, um, these kind of fractionalized phases in a variety of different materials, gallium arsenide, quantum wells, graphene, oxide interfaces, cadmium telluride, and many others. Right? So that's the end of my quick primer, just a broad overview of quantum Hall physics. I want to now take this discussion one step more exotic and try to connect this to the quest for non-abelian enions. The first real uh, key breakthrough in this problem occurred in 1991 due to seminal work from Moore and Reed. So what these, uh, these authors did is they introduced a, a new kind of, uh, of fractionalized quantum Hall phase in which you had excitations that carried uh, a quarter of an electron charge. And those uh, quarter electron charge excitations realize what are known as Ising non-abelian enions. So the word Ising is not so important here. It's just a particularly simple kind of non-abelian enion that, uh, that can, can arise. So this was a very significant development. This was the first time anyone had a concrete suggestion for where in nature you could actually look to find these, uh, these kinds of emergent particles. There was another key breakthrough that happened around 10, 10 years later uh, from, due to work by Reed and Green. So what Reed and Green realized in 2000 is that the non-abelian physics of this uh, exotic quantum Hall phase, which is a highly non-trivial, strongly correlated phase of matter, 
could be distilled into a much simpler weakly correlated platform, namely this kind of superconductor, a two-dimensional spinless P plus IP superconductor. So what this, all this means is that you, you make the superconductor out of spinless fermions that are pairing up in a non-trivial uh, angular momentum channel to give you superconductivity. So the way uh, non-abelian physics appears here is in the form of uh, superconducting vortices. Okay, so all superconductors support vortices, uh, at least type two superconductors, and uh, those, super, those vortices in this context are very interesting objects. They form the non-abelian enneons, which are akin to those uh, E over four excitations in the quantum Hall context. I mentioned earlier that uh, a defining feature of non-abelian enneons is that they give rise to a ground state degeneracy. Right? So let's ask now how in these platforms is this ground state degeneracy encoded? So the answer is that if you look uh, locally around any of these vortices or any of these E over four excitations, there's a very interesting kind of zero energy excitation uh, that's, that's bound, to that, uh, bound to those defects. And uh, those correspond to uh, what I'll call Majorana zero modes. Right? So there's some kind of weird zero energy excitation which is described by a uh, operator uh, which I indicate by gammas. Those operators, those are, they're Majorana operators that satisfy the following uh, algebra. They're Hermitian operators that square to the identity and have fermionic anti-commutation relations. Okay, so that's a defining feature of a Majorana zero mode. Uh, now, for the particle physicists in the crowd, I should caution that um, these Majorana zero modes that I'm referring to here are very different from the uh, things you may have heard out about in particle context. Right? These are not Atori Majorana's fermionic particles that are their own antiparticles. These are really something uh, quite different. So instead of thinking about these as particles, it's much more illuminating to think about each one of these Majorana zero modes that are bound to these, uh, to these excitations as being half of a fermion. Okay. In the following sense, if you want to define a, a fermion that has a well-defined zero or one occupation number, you can only do that by superimposing uh, two different Majorana zero mode operators, for instance, by writing gamma one plus I gamma two or gamma three plus I gamma four. So that's very weird, right? If you think about uh, this picture, for instance, there's somehow a, a, a single fermionic state which is shared non-locally between uh, pairs, of, pairs of these vortices which could be macroscopic distances from each other. Okay. So that's uh, somehow the magic and all this. That's how uh, it's the, the physics of these Majorana zero modes that allows you to ultimately have non-abelian statistics. Okay, so that's how we get ground state degeneracy. If you were to now uh, braid, let's say, two of these vortices around each other, you will uh, find that in general your system goes from one ground state to a physically distinct ground state, hallmark of non-abelian statistics. Uh, remarkably, in precisely the same way as if you had exchanged uh, two E over four excitations in this quantum Hall context, despite the fact that these are uh, superficially at least wildly different physical realizations. Okay, so that was the second uh, key conceptual breakthrough. There's a third, which was due to none other than Alexei. Um, so Alexei realized uh, in 2001 that um, if you just make a one-dimensional cousin of that two-dimensional superconductor, just make a one-dimensional spinless P-wave superconductor, that system can also give us Majorana zero modes. There, there's no vortex physics here, but instead you get Majorana zero modes in these kind of systems just bound uh, to the endpoints of your, of your 1D system. So this raises a, an interesting question. So in these two-dimensional contexts, we know that uh, Majorana zero modes are absolutely essential. They're an in integral part of getting non-abelian statistics. So it's interesting to ask whether there's any sense in which we can harness non-abelian physics from these uh, lower dimensional, one dimension, uh, lower dimensional uh, superconducting systems. Now the historical view on this, uh, uh, on this issue was that uh, exotic exchange statistics and the, inter and, and the existence of enneons was a phenomenon unique to the two-dimensional world. Okay. So as recently as five or so years ago, people assumed that um, Statistics is always trivial in three dimensions. It can be unusual in two dimensions, and it's not even well defined in one dimension. So nowadays, uh, people have um, uh, identified various loopholes in the logic that led to that conventional wisdom. And today, it's, it's appreciated that actually we can uh, harness non-abelian statistics in any dimension, using systems in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, and so on. So I'm going to show you a very simple way of harnessing non-abelian statistics using these uh, one-dimensional superconducting platforms. The key idea is you just need to cheat ever so slightly. You need to uh, move away from strict one-dimensionality. You can do this by patterning wires onto a non-trivial network, like this uh, T-junction, for example. And if you, for, for instance, if you were interested in interchanging these innermost Majorana zero modes here, you could do that simply by uh, moving those zero modes along the following trajectory. This is a perfectly well-defined exchange. And uh, one can, in fact, show 
that uh, the act of braiding these, non these uh, zero remote, sorry, in, this, uh, in these networks transforms ground states precisely as if you had moved vortices or E over four excitations around each other in the two-dimensional uh, setups that I showed you earlier. So this is a project that I actually worked on when I was a postdoc here, uh, with, together with, uh, with Gil Raphael, Matthew Fisher, and others. It's enormously fun. Uh, actually, now, by now this is, seems obvious, but at the time it was not uh, at all clear how this would actually uh, transpire. Um, but the upshot is that uh, this uh, allowed us to, to uh, a completely new avenue along which to, to chase non-abelian anions, right? We can now use one-dimensional building blocks. And the reason to want to use these one-dimensional building blocks, it's not just that it's uh, conceptually new, but actually it's very simple to make these in principle. Okay? So uh, we can in fact design realistic, uh, ge realistic experimental setups that do precisely this and allow us to do precisely that, simply by uh, taking a one-dimensional spinorbic coupled wire, depositing it on a conventional superconductor, so any of, the, any of the thousands of known superconductors that are out there, and then applying a weak in-plane magnetic field. Okay. So this is a work, by the way, by Gil Raphael and company, together with uh, a Maryland group from 2010. So I think it, it doesn't get much simpler than this. Right? So th I'm not going to tell you how, the, how it works. It's very simple, but the important thing is that uh, we have very accessible geometries to make these kind of setups. All of the, the techno technology that we need to build these devices was already in place years ago. So it was really a matter of just uh, putting things together and looking in a regime that hadn't been uh, looked at before. Okay, so experimentalists have indeed uh, um, been inspired by, by these kinds of proposals. Here's a snapshot of uh, several papers from the last few years. Uh, these are all experimental papers, most from different groups. Um, so if you just browse these titles, there's signatures of Majorana fermions, blah, 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 observation of Majorana fermions. Um, uh, Majorana particles, blah, blah, blah. So uh, this is a uh, pretty exciting state of affairs. As advertised, this has indeed become an active experimental field of research. So what I'd like to do now is, given all these experiments, uh, take a step back and ask where we are uh, in terms of realization of some of these ideas and where we hope to be going in the near future. Now, the most basic question that you can ask about these kinds of experimental setups is, uh, is there a Majorana zero mode there? It's the minimal information you'd like to know. Um, so as you can see by glancing at these titles, there's lots of reports of indeed seeing signatures of Majorana modes in these setups. Uh, there's actually some controversy here, and I think the issue is not 100% settled, but particularly given uh, um, unpublished data that's out there right now, um, uh, I think I'm, I'm being, uh, I've become increasingly convinced that the answer to this question, uh, have we seen a Majorana zero mode, is yes. So it's not 100% uh, certain, but I think we can reasonably put a check mark next to this box of have, have we seen a Majorana zero mode. So this is just the beginning of the problem, right? That's where, that's where, you are, where, where we are now. Where we want to end up is uh, up here. We want to see non-abelian statistics and realize fault-tolerant quantum information processing with these things. Now this is an enormous gap, right? So it's not a, uh, that's not an easy ascent to make. So one thing that we're trying to do right now uh, in close collaboration with experimentalists is figure out how, what's the most efficient way to ascend this mountain. And uh, moreover, what intermediate milestones can we establish en route to those uh, grand destinations? And actually, there's a lot of interesting things that one can do with uh, near future uh, capability uh, in, in, in experiments. So some ideas of things that we're trying to explore concrete realizations of is how do you expose a topological phase transition that ought to be occurring in these systems? How do you make and, and verify that you have prototype topological qubits here? How do you probe the fusion rules of these non-abelian enions, which is ever so close, actually, to seeing non-abelian statistics, but can be done in much simpler experimental geometries? Okay. Now, experimentalists uh, that are working in this field, they are very ambitious, and they want to get up to at least this non-abelian statistics uh, milestone on a time scale of a few years. Right? So that's their goal. That's a very ambitious goal. But I think, uh, particularly in light of some breakthroughs in material science of these hybrid systems, I don't think it's insane. I think there's a, a reasonable chance that we can get at least close on that time scale, and, uh, but we'll have to see how, how things progress. But I think it'll certainly be an exciting few years to see uh, some of these milestones hopefully get checked off one by one. Hopefully I've convinced you now that uh, the problem of Majorana-based non-abelian enions belongs squarely up in this upper right corner of the uh, Fisher plot. It's uh, certainly a lot of experimental activity there. Uh, what I'd like to do with my remaining uh, few minutes is uh, take the liberty of moving further along this uh, conceptual novelty axis. So I've been very interested for the last uh, couple of years uh, whether we can try to adapt some of the ideas that are proving very successful in that Majorana problem to uh, 
to make even more exotic kinds of non-abelian anions experimentally accessible. Right? Now, you might ask, why, why in the world would I do this? I mean, the Majorana systems are so nice. Right? Well, actually, I think there's quite good motivation for uh, trying to push things further in this exotic direction, which is that even if we completely master this Majorana technology, even if we can braid perfectly and realize non-abelian statistics, uh, braiding of Majorana modes, it turns out, uh, allows for only limited uh, fault-tolerant quantum information processing. So that means if you want to build a universal quantum computer and, let's say, run Shor's algorithm, you have to introduce unprotected operations, uh, which is uh, certainly not ideal. So the question that I've been trying to answer for years now is, is it possible to uh, engineer, using similar strategies, a fully universal topological quantum computer that's immune from decoherence at every stage of the computation? So we have uh, certainly not found an experimentally plausible way of doing this yet, but at least I can give you a proof of principle that the answer to this question is now yes. So this is the final thing I'd like to tell you about. Uh, once again, we need to go back to quantum Hall effect for some inspiration. So back in the late 90s, uh, Reed and Rizai introduced uh, yet an even more exotic kind of quantum Hall phase uh, that supports uh, a different kind of non-abelian anion, not an Ising non-abelian anion, but instead what's known as a Fibonacci anion. Now, from a topological quantum computing uh, standpoint, Fibonacci anions are, are more or less the holy grail because simply by braiding these things around each other, you can, and you can generate a, a universal gate set. So what makes this uh, reed rezai state special is that it's building in multi-particle clustering properties for the electrons inside of the material. So that is, instead of, um, let's say, uh, having pairing correlations amongst electrons as you have in a superconductor, in this quantum Hall phase, you have clustering correlations amongst triplets of electrons. So I would like to ask, is it possible to emulate the physics of this uh, exotic quantum Hall state by piecing together materials that we already uh, understand and you know, using known phases of matter? So that's a pretty non-trivial thing to do, right? Because somehow, in order to do that, you need to force in, you need to somehow mimic this multi-particle clustering physics that makes reed rezai state what it is. So fortunately, we've, uh, after uh, trying for quite some time, and with the help of many of my uh, collaborators, we figured out a way to do this, at least in principle. So I'm going to show you now a blueprint for a superconducting cousin of this, uh, of this state with Fibonacci anions that is built entirely from things that we already know exist. So here's the basic, uh, the basic ingredient, is we're going to start with a quote unquote simple uh, fractionalized quantum Hall phase. So when I say simple, I just mean something like, the, uh, like a, a phase that has abelian anions of the type that I showed you earlier that can be seen in a myriad of different materials, graphene, gallium arsenide, and so on. Okay, so that's gonna be my canvas, and we're gonna try to force, some, force in Fibonacci anions into that system. So the key is to uh, counterintuitively actually just deposit a bunch of superconducting islands on top of that quantum Hall state. Right? So what those superconducting islands are doing is they're forcing in uh, Cooper pairs made out of charge 2E uh, excitations into that quantum Hall fluid underneath. Now that sounds like a totally bad idea, right? Because I don't wanna pair electrons, I wanna somehow uh, mimic this, uh, this triplet clustering physics that, uh, that's present in that quantum Hall state. But the key point is that that's actually precisely what's going on here. The key idea is that you're forcing in charge 2E Cooper pairing into a quantum Hall fluid that supports fractionalized excitations. Right? So actually, instead of viewing that, uh, that uh, Cooper pair as made out of two electrons, it's more appropriate to view it as built out of three charge 2E over three uh, uh, fractionalized excitations. Okay. So this is actually a very uh, efficient way, in some sense, to mimic multiparticle clustering physics in this quantum Hall context. And indeed, we can show using a variety of tools, actually quite rigorously, that uh, at least there's a portion of the phase diagram where this uh, hybrid superconductor quantum Hall uh, system indeed realizes a phase of matter that gives us Fibonacci anions. Okay. So this is uh, spectacularly exciting to me on a personal level, right? This is something we tried to do for years. And it gives us a proof of principle, at least, that it's possible to combine phases of matter that we already understand very well to make hardware for a fully universal topological quantum computer. So I, I'm uh, more or less at the end of my talk. Uh, just a quick summary. Um, the basic punchline is that um, we're learning how to design exotic phases of matter that have non-abelian anions. There's been a lot of progress in terms of Ising anions that bind Majorana zero modes. That uh, direction is certainly most far along experimentally. So while that uh, progress takes place, as a theorist, you know, it's fun to move a little bit further into La La Land and try to think about more exotic uh, kinds of blueprints. Um, I've told you only about how to make Fibonacci anions in some quasi-realistic setup. Uh, there's other things which I would have told you about if I had more time. We can actually also uh, engineer what are known as parafermion zero modes. Those are some minimal extension of Majorana zero modes. 
And the key ultimately is to just see really neat new fundamental uh, aspects of quantum mechanics and in the long run uh, achieve new kinds of technologies. So if you're interested in, in a very lighthearted review that's almost like bedtime reading that goes a little bit uh, more in depth into what I've uh, discussed here, um, Addy Stern and I put up a, a conference proceedings about some of this stuff uh, pretty recently. So finally, let me just thank many collaborators that I've uh, had the pleasure of working with on this subject. Um, this is all my collaborators on, on, on things related to non-abelian enions. People in bold were associated with uh, Caltech either currently or at some point in recent history. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.